Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Monica Trinnell. I'm an attorney. I've been working in this area for 20 years or more. Um, so I'm going to bring it down to us and a little bit more local. So we're going to talk about electricity and what that means for us here in Montana. Um, this is just a fun fact to make sure you're all still awake and with me. Uh, which city had electricity first? Paris, New York City, or Butte, America? All right. So you're still awake, that's good. That was really the test there. Um, all right, and we were talking, uh, Steve and Brian talked a lot about kind of the, some of the drivers of where we are. I'm gonna talk about the entities that deliver electricity to your home, that bring you heat, cook your food, turn your lights on. So there are essentially, these entities are investor-owned utilities, municipalities, or co-ops. And of those three, the investor-owned utilities are exactly what that says. They're owned by investors, and they're for-profit entities that make money. And here in Montana, other than the Mission Valley po um, Power that Brian referenced, we basically have two types of entities that deliver electricity to your house so you can turn your heat on and cook your food. The investor-owned utility, Northwestern, and the rural electric co-ops. So, the difference between them really being most primarily, most importantly, the profit motive. So the investor-owned utilities are doing it for money and the rural co-ops are owned by their members and so the money goes back to you. Anybody here a member of a co-op? Which co-op? Northern Lights. Northern Lights, yeah. So interestingly, Northern Lights is actually an Idaho-based co-op that serves Sanders County and I think a little bit of Lincoln County. Um, so the Rural Electrification Administration, the REA Act, was part of the FDR administration and created the co-ops and the philosophy, the principle was let's get electricity to every barn, every farm, everywhere in America. Everybody should have heat. Um, so what that means for Montana, the electric co-ops across northwestern Montana, across the entire state really, roughly about half and half in terms of the physical territory of Montana. The IOUs, the investor-owned utilities, the for-profit entities serve about half of the physical geography, and the co-ops serve about another half. And the members actually align roughly with those measures too, Montana being kind of a unique state in that regard. So about roughly 400,000 members of co-ops and about 400,000 members of Northwestern and MVU. Um, the Flathead Electric Co-op, anybody members of that here? Probably not, oh, we got one here. So that's the second largest utility in Montana, Northwestern being the first by, by customer number. Uh, Flathead bought the Avista assets and they're the second largest utility in Montana. Um, so this kind of picks up where the previous slide left off in terms of the service areas and kind of a little bit of what Brian was talking about in terms of the, you see Mission, Mission Valley Power there, you see the electric co-ops, the service areas, the footprints, and then the uh, Northwestern Energy and Green. Over on the east side of the state is Montana, Dakota, which is primarily their service areas really in, in the Dakotas. Um, but what this graph also shows here is that the generation on the western part of Montana, they're part of the, um, the uh, power administrations that generally go west and, and to the west coast. So the difference between the uh, investor-owned utilities is they're in it for money. Their uh, fiduciary duty is to their shareholders. So every time you turn their, your lights on, cook your food, heat your home, that is make it, they're in it to make money. And so they want to sell more of it and they want it to cost. Uh, enough so that they can cover their cost of doing business plus make a guaranteed profit. So Northwestern's largest shareholders are Carlisle and BlackRock. These are, again, you know, corporate entities whose fiduciary duty is to their shareholders. They're about making money, which is fine. That's, you know, they're in the business of making money, that's fine, but they're a monopoly. And so the only restraint on them that sets their prices is the Utility Commission in Montana, it's elected, one of 11 states that elects our utilities. And so they set the prices that the monopoly investor on utility can charge you to heat your home. 
So those are the financial in very, very high level terms, kind of the financial structures of the entities that deliver the electricity to your house. Basically, we're talking about three areas, generation, transmission, and distribution. And Brian touched on this a little bit too, um, the generation and transmission, the distribution lines are the ones that come right to your door. If we did nothing in Montana right now, if we didn't change the, the uh, portfolio, the resource stack, if we did nothing to change what the inputs are that get electricity to your house, we would need to invest in an order of magnitude of billions of dollars in the transmission and distribution lines across the country. Um, it's, they're old and they need to be upgraded. So doing nothing is still going to cost a lot of money in, in maintaining the capital investment and in infrastructure that serves the electricity system that we have in place today. Um, this is a generation map that shows kind of where the, the uh, oh, I did, we, this is transmission, sorry about that. So this, uh, Brian said the answer is transmission, the grid is the answer. Get the electrons where they can be generated by fuel sources that are sustainable to the places where they need to be used. The grid is, um, in large part, the answer to the, to the challenges that we face in today's world. In Montana, we do have actually a fairly robust intrastate transmission system. Um, and the coal strip BPA transmission line that you've all um, seen, um, goes across Eastern Montana. So a fun fact for me is that I'm old enough that I grew up in Southeastern Montana and I was, I lived on the um, Northern Cheyenne Reservation. And so we saw the coal strip plants and that whole thing you know, going in. That's where the rich kids live. And <laughs> then we moved to Broadview, saw the Broadview substation getting built there and that transmission going across Montana. So we do have a fairly robust transmission system in Montana that we can build on and um, do more with. The transmission in, in the uh, United States is, is roughly three grids, the Eastern, the Western, and then Texas has always wanted to be its own, own nation. So, um, so the, the Western grid and the Eastern grid mostly don't intertie. There is a proposal on the table right now, to a uh, Grid United proposal, to have transmission go to Minnesota. And so that would be a huge transmission line. And the first time there is a meaningful DC interconnect between the Eastern and the Western grids, which would give Montana tremendous opportunities for the generation that we, opportunities that we have here. So the generation facilities in Montana as you've already heard, uh, are largely hydro in the Northwest, wind in the central uh, Montana area, and then some wind and, and then the coal down uh, in the Powder River country. Um, so this is kind of what we're looking at in today's world. And you can see the, the capacity um, down on the lower left, but most of the hydro in the Northwest largely serves load on the West Coast. And then we have our solar resources. Again, these are um, not so great in Western Montana. They get better as they go across the state. I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because you've already heard some of this from Brian. Um, but the wind here, and one of the things that, just to pick up on where what Brian, one of the things Brian mentioned, one of the things that's great about Montana wind is it's actually winter peaking. So some of the wind in uh, Eastern Montana can serve load on the West Coast when their wind is dropping down. So again, the transmission really is an opportunity and an answer to the challenges that we're facing today. And I'm, I am kind of going quickly through these because we've been here a long time and I'm, we're, I'm anxious to get to your quick questions. So happy to come back to any of these as we um, move forward into questions. But I think that the takeaway for me really from what we've heard is that we are in the energy transition. A um, hundred years ago, long, long before that, uh, we moved goods by barges. And when the barges, the steam engine came along, what did the barge owners do? What did the canal owners do? They, they built more canals. They were doubling down on the resources that they understood and that they knew. The steam engine came along, replaced canals, and we moved goods with a different resource. 
And then what replaced that? The internal combustion engine, right? And we moved goods and we operated as sapiens on this planet using that resource for a long time. And it worked good. And now we're looking at new opportunities and new resources. The energy transition is, is benefiting Montanans in tremendous ways. We're, um, as we use the resources that we have here locally, um, it reduces the costs. The Northwestern, Northwestern Energy and Investor and Utility just had a rate increase of 28%. And that is a huge line item that affected small businesses and residential customers. Anybody, give me a guess, anybody give me a number. What is St. Patrick's Hospital in Missoula, their annual electricity bill? Can somebody give me a number, throw it out. Two million. One million. Yeah, and a 28% rate increase to a $1 million budget, it's a big line item. And that affects small businesses across the board. And who pays for that ultimately? We do, right. So, you know, when they're in it for money, follow the money, and what they like are big capital plants, centralized, that are far away, so they can make a lot of money off of building big infrastructure. The bigger the kingdom, the bigger the king. That's how IOUs work. So if we can have energy efficiency, if we can reduce how much of it we're actually using, we can reduce some of those costs. Um, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Act, allowed co-ops and local governments for the first time to access some tra tax credits that are really meaningful and really give people meaningful financial incentives um, to do more in terms of solar, uh, hydro, wind, all of that good stuff. Um, that's real money in Montana. I've worked on these projects across the state. Um, I worked on a single wind turbine in Broadview. It generates about one megawatt of electricity, not a lot, but the landowners who were people I grew up with, they get about $10,000 a month on their ranch from that generation. And the substation in Broadview itself, they improved that to the tune of about $500,000. Um, Beaverhead County, south, uh, you, you all know where that is. Their annual um, budget, their annual county um, budget, or not their budget, but their tax base is about a billion dollars. They just built a solar project down there. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, that added $500 million to that county's tax base, doubling it. We don't say no to that kind of money, right? So these are incredible opportunities across Montana that have been real money that goes to the local schools, goes to the hospitals, goes to these counties in rural Montana that need that money. Um, we have the hydrogen hub. You all have heard of that. That's right here in our backyard. And um, we also have our tourism industry here in Western Montana about $4 billion a year. People come in here to see our parks, visit them, um, be in our incredible space. Maybe too many of them are coming, but they're here. And that is, that is a huge part of our economy. That is the biggest part of Western Montana's economy. But guess what happens when the Ruby River is 85 degrees or the Big Hole River is too low and too dry? Nobody's, nobody's able to go there and use those resources. How many ski resorts have already closed this year? I know Great Divide did, Teton did, um, not sure if Blacktail has or not. Yeah, so some of them didn't even open this year. So those are owners, operators, our businesses in Montana. How are they gonna continue functioning? So um, those are things that are taking a real hit right now and that's gonna uh, affect all of us. But here in Montana, I think what we can be proud of is that, you know, it's, it's like we're in this race and we're standing up and we're already out in front by a lap. We're a lap ahead of the whole, the rest of the crowd. We're already doing things right. The co-ops that serve Western Montana have all requirements contracts with BPA, which means that as a matter of fact, we are served almost entirely by renewable resources in Western Montana, largely from hydro, but that's the reality of the world that we live in. When you heat your home, when you cook your food, when you turn on your lights, you are being served by renewable energy. 
So we're already leading the energy transition. What we need to do in Montana is claim that ownership and say, you know what, we know how to do this. We've been doing it. So you can all come with us. We can show you this way and it's gonna be good because it works for us. The cold snap, when it was really cold in January, Flathead Electric, they kept the heat on. They kept the lights on. That was the biggest spike that they'd ever seen. And they did that with their all requirements contract from BPA. So the shift that we need to make really is a financial one. So we have to talk about going from a centralized world where we have big investor-owned utilities who are incentivized to have big plants that they make money on whether they operate or not. If Coal Strip is offline, Northwestern still gets paid the cost of the plant itself, what it costs to own it, the cost to operate it, plus a profit, plus a profit. The plant's not working, but we're paying in our rates every month a profit for a plant that doesn't work. So when we're talking about shifting from centralized utilities to a decentralized model, let's talk about the money that we pay for a need that we have for water, heat, and look, think about how that works. So thinking about uh, generation and storage opportunities, thinking about how we're gonna localize this, this gives us tremendous opportunities to face the changes in the world that's coming. So we're thinking about the big wildfires. You know, the grid, I think, is a huge part of the answer, but there will be times if there are wildfires when it goes down. So how are we gonna have the energy freedom in our communities to be resilient, to meet those challenges? So if we can have our microgrids in our communities, if we can be generating enough electricity here and we can figure that out, there are exciting opportunities um, that lie ahead. Hydrogen is a huge part of that. There was a project proposal in Butte, I think it's kind of stalled out, but it was basically to take the water out of the mine and create hydrogen and then store it. Uh, that might not go anywhere, but people are thinking good minds are thinking about this and there are incredible, you know, exciting proposals that are out there. And one of those is right here in Northwestern Montana. Um, and a part of that was um, in Mineral County. And that brings real money uh, to Montana. So these are investments that we can make in our communities, in our homes, and we know how to do this. We're doing it right now. So there are resources available. Why not be in front of this and do what we've always done in Montana? We've always sent our natural resources out of state and imported money. We can keep doing that. We just are gonna send them a different thing. So <laughs> centralized power, shifting to clean power that we're using here. And really what that does is it's putting our resources to work for us in a way that's exciting. So, you know, we do have challenges. And um, like JFK said when we went to the moon, we do things not because they're easy, but because they're hard. Um, this is a moment that we can meet. And in Montana, we have a particular opportunity and a way to tell our story that I think is really exciting and should give people a, a sense of hope. Um, we have tremendous change, but we've met it. We're doing it here in Montana. And with people like Brian and the energy keepers, I think what their story tells us is there is a way, there are people who are thinking about it in smart ways, and, and we can bring that to the rest of the world, the rest of the country. So this is my family down by in Ashland. <laughs> I say, I'm the six of 10, I say I come from the too much of the best of all school. So, you know, we couldn't build just regular snow people. We had to get in the front end loader and so I was like, who gets to be in the, in the bucket and go up and put the, you know, whatever, the, the carrot in the face. So, but I think that what this shows is, you know, I like building snowmen and I want my kids to be able to build them. And, um, you know, we have to climb a high mountain, but I think together we can do it. And I think that's what really makes our country great is working with good people, good minds. And I think the, the best lies ahead and is yet to come, but we have to face a real problem. We have a challenge and we can do it. Together we can do it. So thanks so much. I look forward to your questions.